So we're here with Jonathan Williams of ALEC. And Jonathan, I wanted to ask you um, about the Rich States, Poor States report that you came out with. Can you kind of summarize what was in that report? Sure, the Rich States, Poor States report is all about how much taxes matter. They matter for growth, they matter for investment, they matter in the future vitality of the states. And the nice thing about the 50 states and the beauty of the American experiment is that we have these 50 laboratories of democracy, as Justice Brandeis would say, that we can analyze which policies work and which policies do not. And that's really the basis for rich states, poor states, is you know what works for economic development, what works for, uh, for uh, just overall growth. And it turns out that free market fiscal policies that keep taxes low, that keep spending under control, really do produce growth in the states. And we're seeing that time and time again, not just in this current year, but over the last decade and after, over the last century, we've seen tremendous growth patterns of people moving, voting with their feet, if you will, and voting with their dollars away from the high tax anti-business states and towards the states that are the most competitive states for those. So what, can you give us some of the summaries of some of the states that were the richer and poorer states, maybe the top few um, and the top bottom. I know Hawaii was in the bottom. Unfortunately, yes, Hawaii did make it into the bottom five states this year, uh, partly because of its high income tax and now having the highest, tied for the highest with Oregon in the nation at 11 percent of personal income in the state. Uh, it's a, a tremendous drag on the economic outlook here for Hawaii and overall competitiveness. Um, also, you find in the bottom five states like New York, California, New Jersey, uh, Illinois is a recent addition into the bottom tier of states as well. Uh, and then on the other hand, you have a uh, Utah, which out of our four editions of Rich States, Poor States so far, has uh, received the number one ranking in every single year of the of the book, which, you know, the governors of Utah love to uh, talk about. But it's really because of their sound fiscal policy record. Uh, they actually uh, created a flat tax in Utah uh, recently, a huge net tax cut. They've been able to undertake fundamental pension reform and to protect taxpayers in that regard. And so really the Utah model has been a fantastic model. And in fact, uh, what we would expect to happen is Utah did come out of this recession uh, as one of the earliest states to make it out of the recession. And so we really do see that connection between policy and performance and economic uh, of, of areas that we analyze in rich states, poor states. Also, of course, the Texas record is very hard to argue against. They've gained four congressional seats over the last 10 years. They've created something like 40 percent of all new jobs that have been created since the economic recovery started, uh, however slow that may be. And so we really do see, in a way, as one of my friends uh, puts it, the balkanization of the American states between the states that are growth states, like Texas and Utah, and the states, on the other hand, are the states that are shrinking and losing population and losing economic vitality and losing business to other places, and those are the states like Hawaii, uh, New York, New Jersey, California. So what about the, for example, employee retirement systems? Is that a major problem across the country? I know it is here. Well, I tell you what, if we think current budget problems are big, uh, they're a drop in the bucket when you analyze them in comparison with the unfunded liabilities and public pension for state and local workers. Now, as you know, a decade or two ago, uh, the private sector moved away from these defined benefit pension plans to the 401k type plans that most all of us are used to. Uh, the one group of employers that did not move to a defined contribution system are state and local governments, where something like 90 percent of, st of state and local government workers still have defined benefit pension plans. Now, these unfunded liabilities in the plans have grown over the years, generally because politicians' unwillingness to curb uh, excessive benefits over time. It's very easy, for instance, for a politician to uh, vote for future benefit increases because the cost does not come up front, uh, but the cost does pile up over time. And we've kicked the can down the road too many times across the states. And now, uh, across the 50 states, we face an aggregate $3 trillion uh, shortfall in public pension plans, which threatens to bury the states and now is, is really a leading impetus towards states to reevaluate and say, financial reality is not negotiable. It's not a partisan issue. In fact, Democrats in Rhode Island a couple of months ago came together and, and produced fundamental reform. Republicans in Utah did it in 2010. Uh, we're seeing this as a trend, and it's a really positive trend. Uh, you know, it's not doom and gloom across the states, uh, totally. We do have some very positive notes for both red and blue states that this can be done, and it needs to be done for the uh, taxpayers across the 50 states.
So where can people get more information about um, your group, which is the American Legislative Exchange Council? Yes, um, people can go to our website, alec.org, that's A-L-E-C dot org. We'll be launching our ALEC blog uh, later on this winter, which will have up-to-date uh, posts from all of the different states. And uh, we encourage everyone to check out the Rich States, Port States publication, which is a free download on our website.